Buon pomeriggio. Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for being here one more time uh, to our book presentation. And uh, welcome again. So we'll be here for uh, five days presenting beautiful books and some DVDs as well. And today, uh, we really would like to start from the beginning in many, many ways. So uh, both books will be uh, really approaching the really beginning of cinema, which we are very, very happy to have Tony Fletcher and Raven Dixon here presenting with us. And uh, so let's start from the beginning, Tony. And how about your book here? I'm gonna, we love to, I, I love to show move the actual books because it's so nice to have printed one and why don't we like it so much so we should be uh, showing to everybody. Well, well I, I wrote this during lockdown when I couldn't go anywhere. So I, most of my books are, have been to do with London County Council records at the London Metropolitan Archives looking at what films were shown in London really up to about 1909. Um, and I couldn't go anywhere for two and a half years, so I was a bit stymied. And so I decided to do something on my own library that I had. Um, and I thought I'd cover the period, which I didn't cover in my book from 1897, which is when the LTC brought in their regulations after the Paris fire. And I thought, well, what happened before the Paris fire? There's not a lot, but there's a bit, and I've got books by John Barnes and 10, 12 other people. And I thought I'd try to document what films were projected in London, uh, going back to the kinetoscope and even looking at what sort of entertainment was going on in London before that. Because um, the London County Council was opened in 1889, and I thought that was a good date to start the book. Um, anyway, what I, what I did is I tried to document all that I could find from really up to May 97. Um, and I stopped, I stopped there. Obviously the first year is mainly to do with Lumiere, Bert Akers and Robert Paul and a few others. And I brought some images from the book for, on Lumiere who I think probably well, I found 13 images, not just what I found myself, but what other people have published. And I'd like quickly to show them to you now if I could and tell you what they are. That's the first one. The, the, yeah, yeah, that's the, the first one there um, where you've got... A, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's it. The pro a program and advert uh, for Lumiere Cinematograph outside of the Empire, probably in February 1896. Next one, please. These are frames from Lumiere's film shows, again, probably taken in February 96. A program for the Empire Theatre for the 21st of March, 96. Um, no film details are given, but it's, it's um, shown in the afternoon in the foyer as well as being in, in the theater. This should be the program for the Polytechnic for April, 1896. Where they do detail the films. Actually, Lumiere, are the only ones who really detail what films they showed. The other filmmakers really didn't. Next one, uh, an another program for the Poly uh, for the end of May 96, which again uh, has, has the uh, film detailed. Next one, please. Now, this isn't in my book. I sent a copy of it to Nick Kiley, who some of you may know, and he sent me this ticket, which was f for the Poly for the 21st of May, 1896. Um, for London Views, 30 minute performances between two and six in the afternoon. Now this might be 
possibly one of the earliest cinema tickets. I certainly haven't seen another one. This obviously is blown up. It's, it, it's, it's quite small, you know, originally. It's a pity it's not in the book, but you're seeing it. Uh, Lumiere did move from the Poly and uh, from the Empire um, uh, with Truy, and this is one of the first places to move to, which is the Battersea Palace. And I originally thought this was 1898, but a friend, Barry Anthony, dated it for me to the 10th of August, 1896. And, on, and it, lists, it lists the films. Um, yeah. Next one is the Crystal Palace. They went there the week afterwards on the 20th of August, 1896. Yep, next one. Again, they detailed the films there. Um, they're still at the Empire Music Hall, Variety House, and this is the programme for the 5th of October, 1896. Yep. Right, I hope this is the one for the Crystal Palace for the 15th of October, 1896. Um, in fact, the, the two Crystal Palace ones, I think I'm the only one who's published those, I don't think anybody else has, um, but um, it was a big venue, Crystal Palace, so a lot of entertainment, and I'll mention it again in a minute, penultimate one, uh, programme for the Empire, 9th of November 1896, which advertises the cinematograph outside the theatre, I did show this before, but for the, for the top one, this is for the bottom one, and the final one, I found is a programme for the Empire for the 8th of February 97, which surprised me, because I thought that Lumia had gone by then, but it seems that they hadn't, because Jolly took over, Jolly Cinematograph. Now, I'm sure there's a lot, m there are more um, uh, adverts, and it's very important, because Lumia do list the films. But um, I just wanted to say a couple of things in addition about how the films were projected and the screen size, because it's not really been documented. And, and for Lumiere, and the reason why I'm saying this is because we assume that films were always front projected, and they weren't. Um, a lot of the films were rear projection. And for Lumiere at Marlborough Hall, they projected from the gallery. So that was, because obviously, the standard way we think that films are, are shown. And at Crystal Palace, they did build a projection box. So I think both of those we would think are front projection. However, at the Empire Theatre, I'm not so sure because it's advertised that they projected the film on the stage, 20 foot from the screen. Now, I don't know if this means 20 foot at the front of the stage or 20 foot at the back of the stage. Um, I tend to think it's probably behind the screen, but not sure. But the other filmmakers, for example, Paul, he's front projection at the Royal Institution, and but rear projection when he showed films at the City of Guilds, the Alhambra, and the Olympia. Um, not sure about Acus. Can't find whether he did front or or, or, or rear projection. As regards to screen sizes. The only one for Lumiere I can find was at Marlborough Hall, where the screen was four foot by four foot six, which isn't very large. I found no screen sizes for Paul, but for Acres I found three. At Anderson's Hotel, which I assume is a, a room, probably the size of this, it measured seven foot by five foot. At the Kineopticon, which is his cinema, that he ran for three months, it was six foot in diameter. While at Marlborough House, which is not the same as Marlborough Hall, which, is, which was part of the London Poly, Marlborough House was where the royal family lived, or part of the royal family lived, and he had a film there, film show for the royal, for the, uh, royal family. It was 11 foot by eight foot six, which is the largest screen size I've come across. I don't think many people have, have uh, documented this, and once I'll 
thought I'd make, make a start of it. Right. Yeah, it sounds um, a lot because the, the, the book itself is full of technical information and many of different ways and sources, which is very nice. I found very fascinating there was uh, one reproduction of a technical uh, sheet that explains how the different loading system are uh, in, the, in the film projector. So I thought that was uh, very specific and interesting because you see that already in the beginning there was a variety of option, technical wise, on how to project. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what you're referring to. I'm sure about because I, I can't remember that. Um, I try to avoid technical issues because I'm not technically, I'm not great with technical things. So I'm sure that information has come, I've read that somewhere in a report. What I tried to use were, were reports done which were contemporary to when the films were shown. So for example, most of them are 1896 and 1897. Although I did add in people's memoirs and memories, which often were different from possibly what may have happened at the time. Because um, a lot of, a lot of well, some of the uh, early pioneers lived into the 30s, 40s, and 50s, some of them. And they did write their memoirs or letters and correspondence. And I did include this in a heading which I called Conjectures. Mm -hmm. So I didn't put it down as being factual. I tried to keep the factual stuff to what I could find advertised in the periodicals uh, at, 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 and, and press at that, at that time. And you thought that on that there was many discrepancy you found then by what they remembered and what you actually find or what do you think? There was more discrepancy or more just a different interpretation, let's say? I think that people's memories can be very, very faulty. Uh, I mean, there were one or two examples in 1936 which was the, same, the 40 years anniversary uh, they had in, in Britain, when there were lectures by a number of people like Bromhead and Paul, um, and, and they, they, they were, there was a transcript of these lectures, but there were questions afterwards, and these questions were um, typed out. Um, so he, he, I assume they weren't taped, I assume they were handwritten or by a stenographer or whatever it would be at the time. But one or two of the pioneers who were present gave information which you would think was, was wrong. I mean, some of the machines they named were not the machines that you would have called them there at the time. Um, but it could be that, <laughs> that some of them may have, may have been suffering from incipient Alzheimer's, as we, as we say now. <laughs> um, but then one or two did talk about how I think I think um, uh, how how they how they I think Monty Williams was one of them how he actually copied or made his first camera or their first camera from looking at the Lumiere camera on the on the QT and uh, now whether that's true or not mm -hmm. I, I don't know but it's it's you know you, one has to look at it as as a possibility. Yeah, I, th I mean, uh, that exact time in, 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 in cinema history is so live, but also uh, there is a lot of things going. I always imagine like, you know, like a, a pot boiling. So you don't know really what's going on. There's many things going exactly at the same time sometimes, so it's hard to catch what uh, exactly is. How about the content, though? You also um, uh, try to investigate what was screened, not only uh, where and how, and there is many interesting uh, things on that, too. Uh, the content of the movies that were screened and, and, and where, of course. Well, I, at the back, I've listed all the, f all the films that were shown. I, I listed all the one films that were sort of to do with London, because London is the focal point of the book. And then I've listed all the films that were not about London, um, and try to work and try to say who I thought made those films. Um, there's a lot of blanks, so there's quite a few films, and I don't know who who, who made them, and I wasn't going to guess uh, who made them. I think there's probably probably quite a few French films there. Um, certainly, a lot of Méliès films were shown because a man called David Devant 
um, who, who worked at the Egyptian Hall, um, he bought a projector from, from Paul, but he bought four. And he, he, in, he was touring the country with three other people um, projecting films. And some of those films were, 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 were he, he, he bought from many as. Um, it's a bit complicated about um, who bought what camera when. Uh, a lot of them did come from Robert Paul, and there are records of his ledger having survived certainly to about 1930s, when Will Day saw it, and he did list a number of the people who bought what number machine, number two or number three or number four. But unfortunately, it's gone missing since. Otherwise, we, we would have a lot more information unless, unless uh, somebody here knows where, where it might be. <laughs> and uh, you were mentioning uh, right now, I mean, the focus of the book is London. And uh, therefore, there is a lot of program, and the the ticket you were you were showing us too. There is London View, of course, so that was the main thing. Uh, but it's interesting to know, as you mentioned, and it's and it's not uh, in the book, but it could be, of course. There is also London was the focus point, the starting point, but then the cinema was spreading around uh, England as much as possible. So it was interesting, I guess, to see uh, what was so popular in London. Maybe have traveled then around or not. Well, I think, I think uh, in this early stage, I wouldn't like to say how important Lon London was. Um, one of the things I put in the book is at the back is an appendix, is, is, is a sort of uh, my transcription of part of G.A. Smith, who was a Brighton filmmaker, part of his cash book and, and particularly his ledger. And it gives details of all his customers. And I've listed all his London customers, but all his other customers outside London, there's a lot of those as well, and what films he, he sold to them. Um, I mean, I think, I think there, was a, there, there was obviously a fair film business on the South Coast, also in the north of England. Mm -hmm. And how linked they were, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, it, it might well be they were rivals um, at the time. Although, obviously, w by 1898, I think it had become a much bigger business. Um, but um, other people like Vanessa knows more about that than me, that North thing, so I, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, that's exactly. I think the, 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 the year you focus your gaze on are so uh, specific. And y you do feel that, yes, a lot of people are trying something new. And they're trying very hard in, in a moment which it was still possible. Then everything got more standardized and so. So it's very interesting to see how the different combination to uh, you you uh, transcribe a lot in the femoris to uh, how the different program was still very mixed with a uh, uh, sliding system. For example, there was uh, some that very interesting in the uh, Salvation Army too. Uh, that was interesting. So there was a mix of well, many things. I, well. I've actually written a book on Salvation Army mm -hmm. film. So that's the, the, I, I, want, I wanted to include that because it did actually start mm -hmm. before May 97. But, but also about the entertainment. The one I showed at the Battersea Palace earlier, Charles Chaplin's on, on the bill, you know, which, um, he, he, you know, which is Chaplin's father mm -hmm. was, was performing there. And, and, we, we, and he would have seen films there. Mm -hmm. um, that's 1896. I mean, that's that's early. Yeah. Yeah. That's really the beginning. So, before I have more question for you, let's see somebody from the audience has some question, comment, uh, something to ask. Uh, yes, we don't have a microphone, but I'm going to repeat. Oh, yeah, we do have a microphone. Sorry about that. Stephen, yeah, I can hear him. Well, Tony, first of all, congratulations on the book and also the other three in the series about London up to 1909. Um, we, and the others, I think, are even better than this one. And they're, but they're, they're all packed with information. And I think we should all pay tribute to Tony's work in this respect because I don't think people quite realise the efforts he's put into, in, especially in the London Metropolitan Archive, 
he's, I mean, he's been through these huge ledgers, which are so enormous and so tightly bound, they're really difficult to open. So it's kind of, it's physically a difficult job. And yet he's, he's gone through these things. He's found these incredible programs and letters and letterheads. And uh, people really should see the other vol volumes as well because they're, they're really, um, really wonderful. But my uh, other point is this. Uh, you said the Robert Paul um, account book doesn't survive. And I think that's right from what I know. But some material that does survive is from Trouet or Treve, as they say in France. Um, I've been hunting this for some time and finally tracked it down to an archive near Avignon um, in southern France, in his hometown. So I'm hoping to see that uh, maybe next year. Um, but from the photographs I've is initially seen, there's not a huge amount new about his UK performances. Um, but the historian Yves Chevaldonne, who's who pointed me to this, uh, seems to think there are a few items. So we may be able to add to your, what, 10, 10 items you've got there. I didn't get the final question there, sorry. No question. No question, it was a comment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, comment, all right, all right, all right, all right. So. Charlie. Neither for the streaming, that's why, so people at home can hear. Thank you. So, um, uh, unless I missed something, I'm, I'm curious about how many, uh, how much the cinemat cinematograph Jolie was in London, you know, the, the projector that actually was involved in the fire in, in Paris, um, and, and, you know, it was in New York as well. Um, in this in this period bef before before the charity uh, the charity fire. Yeah, I've got a problem here. I'm sorry, it's my hearing isn't great. So, uh, so the sorry. cinematograph Jolie, right, uh, which was a whole different system, and which was the the projector that caught fire at the charity bazaar uh, in in Paris. Yeah. How, how, oh, how present mean, was it in London? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, in Paris, you mean? Well, yeah, but the projector, I mean, the cinematic, cinematograph Jolie was being shown, for instance, at the Eden Musée in, the, in New York City uh, before the fire, and when the fire happened, then they replaced right. it. I, I'm, I'm not, I, yeah, I'm, I, yeah I, I think I, I'm going to have to pass on you on that, because I can't get everything you're saying. Sorry about that, but I, I can't. Oh, I see. I don't know. I, um, the, the, I mean, Professor Jolly uh, certainly was in England, was in Britain, but I, I, I don't know whether he took over the Lumiere contract or not, or whether he used a different system. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> well, we can talk about it later. Somebody else? Some other? Question or comment? Yeah. So Tony, I just wanted to know how big the the places were where they showed the film and the Empire Theatre. If this is musical theatre in London, please tell me. She wants to know how big it was in terms of theatre, that is the film and the Empire Theatre in particular. Well, the 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 the, the theatres were <laughs> music halls mainly. Mm. I mean, they would have been. Massive, mm. um, although I think they weren't always successful. So at the Empire, they they did move them for a period to the foyer in the afternoon, which would be a, a, a smaller space. Um, but ma but many of the public halls would have been this size. I would I would think, uh, um, and there would have been and there would have been even smaller venues than that. Um, uh, that I mean, I probably only documented, I reckon, about 30% of the film shows in London. Um, I think there's probably 
another couple of hundred that I haven't found yet. I, I should say that also that I, a lot of the research I did was at the BFI and at the Cinema Museum. And um, I, I would like to obviously give a bit of gratitude to that for their help. All right, I don't know if there is any other question. I will have a final one then for you. Uh, how much this transition to cinema um, was mixed with all the other art that were involved in theater, so, you know, as um, music performance and theater performance, how much of a combination was? Was it bigger? Was it quickly switching to cinema, or it took some time also to connect? Uh, uh, well, I think general opinion was that it, it, it wouldn't last long, like the Connecticut lasts about 18 months, um, but they were wrong. Um, it's still going today, <laughs> as we see. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, Tony. Right. Thank you so much. <laughs>so now we are not moving geographically we're just moving a little bit on time or almost saying at the same time you, you have yes so yes let me switch the slide i want to thank Marioni for being here with us and uh, for the unfortunately already sold out book. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, they didn't send enough books. I said no. send a box, and they went, it's way too expensive. We'll send a few. Uh, so they sold out immediately. Yeah. But thank you. So whoever got it should have got yeah. it signed from you now because it's even more rare. But uh, still, yeah. <laughs> you can see it. It's very lovely. <laughs> so um, It's very cheap, and you can get yeah. it online. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's it's a big overview on the Victorian age, which is lovely and and complete. And uh, who, me that I was lucky to read it also amazing in a way. I was saying because it's open to everybody, which is great. And but it's it feels very complete, which I bet it takes some it took some time. Uh, that's nice of you to say. I'm sure yeah. it isn't complete because you know there are uh, there is. Um, I think Pamela Hutchinson, in her excellent review, thank you, Pam, in Sight and Sound, said that uh, there is more to be said on Victorian film and more that has been said. And this is very true. Um, it's an area that has been much written about in Britain. We're very lucky. We've had a number of very excellent um, reviews in, in a sort of uh, macro sense of British cinema. So we've had Rachel Lowe with her unbelievable um, and still perfectly good uh, set of books on early British film. John Barnes, of course, with his five-volume set for the first five years. So it's extraordinary. Um, so I was slightly intimidated taking on this task um, on behalf of the BFI. The reason for the book is it's um, part of a series, a new series of screen guides, they're called. So it's they're intended to be general for an interested but general audience and I think will be most useful for example for people who are comparing different countries for example um, where they want something you know a potted history um, bringing up some of the issues and some but you know not it's certainly not the last word or indeed every word on the subject the, there are so many stories coming out you know you are uncover a rock and find an awful lot of stuff underneath, um, much of which is um, completely fascinating. I would like to say I also used um, Tony's set of books, which are excellent and incredibly useful. You get so much information out of seeing um, the early kind of paperwork, the ads, the trade press. Uh, incredible, really. And you can get a real flavor and feel for how the films were presented at the time. So um, that was my starting point, was to um, really talk about films out with cinema, with a capital C. So to look at the overview of uh, moving image 
uh, types of moving image. So the chapters are all types of films. They're not exactly genres. Mm -hmm. um, they're types of films and uh, they're each type of film has a kind of, um, you know, there are things like optimal lengths of films, you know, so animation, you know, develops its sort of seven minuteness and uh, dramas become longer and longer, even, you know, by the end of this period, going up to the end of 1901, things are beginning to, to become longer, uh, whereas actualities stay about the same and they just head into newsreel and thence to television. Uh, so all of these different forms, you know, and then some things develop into what we know of as cinema later on. But if you take this very long-term view, um, you can also incorporate the, the trajectory into what is happening now with another format change into digital. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a good way of looking at it because if you do types of films, you can sort of see, you can track them sometimes through cinema history or sometimes they go round and reappear in TV and some things hop over and turn up back online, you know, so everybody will know, you know, the similarities between very early Victorian film and, you know, TikTok videos. They are little films, you know, in the Tom Gunning mode cinema of attractions. They are little things that just go, here I am, isn't this amazing? I'm really short. <laughs> and uh, so I think it's, you know, that, that sort of way of structuring the book was trying to get that message across. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of uh, specific content that are very interesting and a lot of connection to actually movie that survived, which is also, if I'm not wrong, it's 21% uh, what what uh, is left, and still uh, all of that, their reach of content uh, on, on on several notes that I have, there is just like uh, the Queen Jubilee and the research you've done and the position of the camera of the different uh, operators that is really fascinating, really really fascinating. Yeah, and uh, much of the work on the Diamond Jubilee was, was done by. Um, uh, Barnes and uh, Luton Kernan as well did a, a big thing on the Jubilee and unearthed some, um, I think for the first time began to um, expand out what Barnes had done on plotting where all these cameramen were for this amazing event. Um, it's extraordinary really when you put together the films that we have, we've got nine basic versions of footage by different companies of the Diamond Jubilee. In the BFI's archive alone, there are at least 350 different elements, all of which have multiple copies, many of which have been then put in compilations and TV uh, documentaries and what have you over the years and in newsreels and what have you. So there are now thousands versions of films of the Diamond Jubilee, um, unpicking all of these and getting them in their little groups with all these cameramen that you can see on a, on a diagram where they were standing in relation to the big procession that was going around London, um, is going to take, well, the rest of my life probably, <laughs> the rest of my career anyway. <laughs> It just goes on and on, and it drives everyone mad because they're called Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. Um, you know, and you're not allowed because of, anyway, you're not allowed in databases to sort of put the company in the title. So you've got to go through all these things anyway, nightmare. Um, but a fascinating exercise in um, how collaborative the early filmmakers were. I mean, really extraordinary that apart from Edison, everybody was there, I think. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Yeah, and, and it's interesting also that, of course, you, you try to go as as much as possible, because there's some limits on that, on each of them backgrounds, on all the early filmmaker backgrounds, where did they come from, why they were doing this, and how it was still the novelty. And they were coming from different areas. That's that's why their perspective most likely on movies were different. Yeah, exactly so. But what I think is the 
sea change in writing a book now compared to writing a book 40 years ago is that you have all these sources of things like we've been talking about Tony uncovering. You know, we can now use the souvenir booklet of the Diamond Jubilee, which is fantastic. It's got a map on it, so you know where everything is, and it details the parade and all of the different troops from all the different countries and colonies because this was imperial days. So you know exactly where you are in the parade. You can always tell Queen Victoria is coming because everyone goes back crazy <laughs> with the handkerchiefs and what have you. So you go, right, that's her, you know. <laughs> so uh, the, the behaviour of crowds changes not at all, you know, in a hundred and something years. So there are all these wonderful things and tickets and, you know, how much it costs the filmmakers to have a place to stand with their cameras, um, which actually there are court cases about. Um, people felt they'd been cheated out of where they were to put their camera and somebody with a big hat st stood in front, you know. So there are several um, films that don't exist because they failed mm -hmm. in some technical sense or, or failed to survive, like the Biograph mm. films, which don't survive. But yeah, the point of uh, the other point, the big point of the book was to base it as largely as possible on the films that survive, which have all been digitized, some restored, uh, and all of them were digitized from film. So we didn't muck about with horrible video copies. And so the improvement in the quality has made an enormous difference. So you can see people's faces, you know, you can see lots and lots of detail. Uh, these are all freely av available. Some people um, may not live in the UK, apparently. Uh, so mm -hmm. there apparently are ways <laughs> of getting to see <laughs> films <laughs> online. Mm. Uh, but I, of course, know nothing about this. <laughs> I've just been told. Yeah. But uh, so you can study the films and read the background in the book. Uh, mm. There were some interesting thoughts, and I think my overriding impression of those early days is the youthfulness and the excitement. There's a new medium, and everybody, all the filmmakers were young. You know, these were young men. Victorian society was a young society. The average age in Victorian Britain was 24. Wow. And the average age is now 43 in the UK. So there were lots of young people. Young people in particular respond to moving image in a um, sort of primeval way. Anyone who's got a baby knows this. Mm -hmm. Or anyone who's ever seen a baby, you know, you just stick a phone with a moving image in front of their face and, you know, everything else disappears for them. So it was the same with moving image in those days. And, it, it's, uh, and they did everything in the Victorian age, everything. They tried absolutely everything in the first mm -hmm. few years, and including archiving. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are people who were Trying already knew mm -hmm. that the relationship we have with time had changed, and that from now on, um, time w could be recorded effectively you know we would be able to look back and there are wonderful um, people writing in those very early days that make this point you, you mentioned that a lot of the catalog in, looking through the catalog is clear how there were uh, the movies were divided by groups there was a very uh, so early there was a specific idea how how to appeal to what kind of public or what kind of interest could it be just um, even if it was the beginning was clear that the public could be, as we were saying before, could get tired very early of the novelty of the cinema. So you have to really be more and more specific at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, it happens incredibly quickly yeah. as well. Um, so if you think back to recent times when perhaps you were, you know, on a train or a station or you were going down the London Underground or whatever and the first time you saw a screen with a moving image was you were going down the escalators. How long did it take you to get used to that novelty? 
you know, you thought, oh, wow, what I saw today, and then that's it. You know, this is now normal. <laughs> yes, <laughs> So exactly. it does happen quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and therefore also news were interpreting in that sense, and uh, that I thought it was extremely fascinating as well. So they were no, not only screening them, but, and I'm talking about the, the beheading of the Chinese boxer specifically, <laughs> that yeah. I thought was uh, amazing to see how that early, that the cinema is used as a system, not only to record, but also to reinterpret uh, news and, and part of reality. Yeah, so news again was quite different and delivered in a different way. Um, so news often was delivered as story. Um, so you didn't have that sort of sense of immediacy, although they could get news to you the same day, as we all know from you know, the wonderful stories of uh, R.W. Paul and W.K.L. Dixon managing to record an event and getting it onto the screen for the same day. But generally speaking, um, news is a story. Um, so beheading of a Chinese boxer is, is a story about something going on on the other side of the world. And then it's been reinterpreted in the sort of almost fictional sense, so the same with the Boer War. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it is very uh, fascinating in that sense how already there was this uh, need of be pushing what was cinema as much as possible. And we always say when we think about silent cinema, but broadly about silent cinema, oh, you know, everything was done. Not people can, you know, the broader audience sometimes forget about it. But in your book, it's clear that that was from the beginning, which is really yeah, fascinating. Yeah, right, right from the beginning. They, they just tried all these different things and, and some things then began and, and this is um, the other question I get asked about the book is why why Victorian you know because not everybody has a Victorian age um, so why 1895 to 1901 you know because this is not a normal you know Rachel Lowe I think went up to 1906 so 1901 um, you can already see very noticeable differences between 1896 and, and 1901. So the, these genres, these types of films are, are beginning to specialize out. So you're beginning to get dramas and story film. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got color, mm -hmm. which is going two ways. It's either trying to be mm -hmm. hyper real mm -hmm. or fantastical. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, all sort of sound, of course, mm -hmm. They tried it, mm -hmm. uh, not very successfully, but we do have one film, Kitty Mahone from um, 1901, where we've got the sound and the picture. Mm -hmm. And to put them together is a crazy spooky feeling <laughs> from such an yeah. early time, 1900s. Yeah, so uh, yeah, they absolutely tried everything. That, that is great. And, and also yeah. understood, I think, about um, you know how um, important mm it would become. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, it, so was, it was clear there was so much that can be done. I was going to read you a little yeah, quote, oh, which is because it's sort of relevant. Um, so this is from a guy, a Canadian scientist. So he's looking at the invention of cinema from a sort of scientific um, perspective. But he says, as a means of permanently recording and vividly illustrating notable events, uh, film's importance will scarcely be overestimated. I shall content myself, he's just trying to describe what it is to people, uh, with a brief allusion to one recent event in which the whole world has evinced keen interest, viz. the celebration of the Diamond Jubilee of Her Majesty Queen Victoria. Um, the royal procession and other imposing features of the Jubilee ceremonials were duly recorded on cinematographic films, of which fine specimens were set aside for the future preservation in England's National Museum. These have been hermetically sealed and deposited in the museum together with a machine and lantern by means of which they may be exhibited to future generations. We can only strive to realize in some dim measure the fascination which those pictured ribbons of celluloid will exercise upon the minds 
of, the f of future Londoners, let us say, at some remote epoch when the throne of Great Britain will be occupied by a monarch of whom we can form no conception. That's King Charles. <laughs> uh, under social conditions which may differ widely from those existing at the present day. So you can already see somebody, um, you know, is, is a bit like uh, that kind of image of the New Zealander looking at the ruins of London in some future time. So he's already seeing how we will interpret history through film. And he's right, because that's exactly what's happened. Right, great. Some question, comment, or I don't know, something somebody want to ask? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for writing this book. I cannot wait to read it. And uh, as someone who looks at a lot of new telecities of old footage myself, I, I, and you've touched on this, the clarity that is now possible to see some of these. You've been watching many of these films, I know, for, for decades of your life. But are there any particular ones that just struck you in some fresh way because of the transfers, whether it was some recognition of behavior that seemed uh, ahead of its time, but we now realize was not? Any, any revelations because of the, the retransfers? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, certainly the large format films, which we did some restoration work on the biograph films shot by W.K.L. Dixon in Britain and around Europe, uh, definitely a revelation because the clarity is so, you know, I mean, astonishing, really astonishing. And certainly when I show TV company people these films, they're just, what? But that's not what old film looks like. You know, going, well, it is. And they're going, oh, but how can we tell it's old? <laughs> Which is a really good point, actually. How can you? Uh, you know, you, I told you it is, so... That's as far as you can get. You know, you need to do the, the, the research these days because otherwise there is nothing to tell you that it's that old. You know, these people could be wearing costumes or da 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 but, you know. So, yes, the, the realness is extraordinary. So little kids paddling in the seaside at Rill and then hitching up their pants and all that sort of stuff, and you go, oh, wow, people then were exactly like us and grass was green and sand was gritty and, and you know, all these things, it really is an astonishing connection that you feel with, with the people. Um, so it makes a big difference. When you can see people's faces, I think, it really makes a huge difference. Thank you. I was fascinated, Bryony, to hear about the sound film that was made and just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about the technical side of that and how they did it and whether it worked and does it sync up now? I mean, it's fascinating. Well, I mean, digital means you can do, you know, all sorts of things, but obviously you have to do it in an ethical way that reflects the technology of the time. So they were very aware, filmmakers, right from the start, that the problem of not having sound with, with picture. Uh, so one of the first things they tried to do was to use the recording systems that existed at the time, which were phonographs and gramophones, and to somehow connect them. Uh, there was also a good commercial reason for this, you know, when the talkies finally came, you know, the, the possibilities for marketing spin-offs of film and gramophones and music and songs and sheet music and all that really made a big difference economically. Um, so they were very keen to do it. So the first, uh, the particular one I'm talking about, Kitty Mahone, is a song that was recorded by um, a musical artiste called Lil Hawthorne. Uh, she had recorded this song, Kitty Mahoney, it was her trademark song, and they then made the film to go with the music. So it was the film, the sound was recorded first, and she lip-synced 
to it. Uh, and she had gestures that went with bits of the song. Um, so you could sync it fairly precisely. You do have to do a little bit of jiggery pokery, and they did at the time. It wasn't perfect sync. The other thing to remember, why it took so long for all these things to happen, is that you need to have, um, with projectors, you remember they're, they're being done by hand at this time. There are some electric motors, but not many. And gramophones run with an electric motor, or sometimes they're wind-up ones. So you can't sync them very easily. And the reason, you know, the talkies came when they did was because scientists and found a way to synchronise more than one motor, more than one electric motor. So what they did was the best that they could do, which was to play the gramophone record, and they had no amplification, they had a huge horn. And if you imagine being in a room this size with, you know, 300 people, uh, a, even a big horn is not going to be perfect. So you have the film playing on the screen and this gramophone record playing and people going a bit like that. So it never, it was a little novelty. It went on for some years. Gaumont then did it uh, more successfully. Hepworth did a thing called the Vivaphone. Vivaphone, yeah. Um, and there were various systems. So it just kept on going. And then the Forest Phono in the 20s was the first one to make it commercially viable. Okay, thank you. Let's open another one here. Um, Brian, you mentioned, obviously, uh, like writing slightly in the shadow of Rachel Lowe and John Barnes. People have written about this a lot before. At the end of the day, where did you most take issue with them? Oh, that's an interesting one. I don't think I did. I'm not sure that I did take issue with them. Um, or, even think, or even think there's things they missed here. Well, there, I mean, there are, obviously there are things they couldn't have known. Um, so the whole Mitchell and Kenyon thing has been a you know total game changer, um, and so yes, a lot of the initial histories are written very London centric point of view, um, and we really didn't know apart from you know newspaper notices what was going on in the rest of the country. So yeah, Mitchell and Kenyon has been the big thing that's that's completely different. Um, and I think we've done more work as an international set of people to compare what's going on between different countries. Um, so that's been, I think, relevant. Um, I have a slight problem with the pole first thing because it all feels like you've got this amazing new industry, fascinating, exciting, here are all these great films and this new medium being born and everybody wants to go Ooh, how long was it how tall was it you know was it the first does that make britain better than america does that make france better than germany you know drives me a bit nuts so i was keen to like not to do that but i didn't really have i don't i honestly don't have an issue with um i, I don't think there's anything um it's not a, like a progression of, of learning, actually. Sometimes the great history has, has been done. And I honestly think that Barnes is you know, pretty perfect. There's very little in it that is wrong, except what you're going to tell us <laughs> in yes. your forthcoming studies. <laughs> and that's, that's what you do. You, know, you, you make a start and, you know... Even though it's 120 years old, film's quite new. There is maybe one last one, or maybe two. We'll see. Thank you. In the excerpt that you just read to us a few minutes ago, somebody writing about the scientific, you know, discovery of, of film, there was a really interesting note uh, that communicated a sense of someone realizing their impending obsolescence. 
Uh, and always it strikes me that what you've shared with us today um, reinforces that sense of film offering an amazing moment of vitality and immediacy that goes hand in hand with, you know, mortality. <laughs> like, oh my God, we're going to die. Uh, and it seems as if the, um, the widespread um, effect of uh, the cinema made that feeling perhaps more apparent. And I'm wondering whether you did discover in some of the anecdotes and the interviews this gasping sense of we're alive right now, but we won't be. Yeah, definitely. Um, contemporary writers at the time talk about this a lot. Um, they talk about how the word vivid comes up a lot. Uh, and this is the crucial thing about um, moving image, is it's more vivid. Uh, this is good and bad in equal measure. It makes things more vivid at the moment, but it's the, the bright light that makes the other bits darker. So, like, we all have memories. If we've got a photograph of something, that blots out an awful lot of your actual memory, because it's more vivid. And uh, certainly people had a relationship of, you know, like almost everybody being famous for 15 minutes because they're in their Michelin Kenyan film because they've gone down at lunchtime to come out of their factory door and be on the screen and, you know, marvellous. Uh, and that, again, you know, it does, as you say, you know, that's going to live forever. Well, only if the archivists do their job. <laughs> But, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. I, it does give you a sense of um, the shortening of lifespan because you, you, you start looking at sort of biographies from beginning to end and we all watch a lot of stories in movies and uh, we watch a lot of lives and trajectories so we always, we're measuring where we are on that timeline all the time. And it's a bit depressing, actually. You go, oh, God, I've only got 20 years left to, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, so film definitely does that. And it's great, and it's also bad in some ways. So last, last one, I think, over there, unfortunately. Over, over there, yeah, I know. Paolo? Yes, at the back, back. Si. Un'ultima domanda in fondo, in fondo. Yeah, sì. There will be maybe time later on at the end. In fondo, in fondo. I had a question about uh, uh, foreign f um, filmmakers, operators working, uh, working in Britain. I assume you also talked about the Lumiere brothers, for instance, and operating in, in Britain as well, as par apart from British uh, photographers, operators. But do you, can you stabilize something about the choice of themes or s topics made, between, um, uh, made by British uh, filmmakers or by foreign filmmakers? Is it just that they foreign filmmakers only shot the, the canon of tourism or did they go beyond that? And the same also with the British filmmakers. I mean, we know from the Mitchell and Kenyon collection that a very typical local topics very often chosen and which deviate, let's say, from the standard themes that you may uh, suggest. Can you say something about that? Yeah, um, so yes, with foreign operators, foreign companies coming to make films in this country, they do nearly all conform to the event. Um, things that are tailored to the audience for a particular show. So, uh, as you know, Lumiere operators, um, when they went to a venue, a, a place to do the show, would film the location and then show you the film um, as part of the show. Uh, sort of strange, self-reflexive thing. Um, they don't then have a kind of... There's no sense um, 
of a kind of investigative journalism. You know, they don't then go, oh, we must go to uh, Sheffield and see what's going on there. Um, they, they only go to things that have been well, um, sort of well-trodden routes in exactly the way that I know you've worked on Evo before, um, following the tourist trail. They're, and they're almost following not even the, the writings or the information. They're, they're following photographs and pictures and making those move. Um, so, uh, yeah, in no sense do you feel that, that there's any, any sort of anything further than that in, in genre terms. Um, and I think the thing with the way the book's structured is, is it follows fashions. So there are particular fads or fashions for types of films. Uh, everybody copies the Lumiere's. Um, you know, they go, oh, there's a thing of a baby. Uh, we need to have a film of a baby. And, you know, they've got a film, RW film, Paul's got a film of the sea, so we better go and film the sea, and so on and so forth. And then you get things like factory gate films made for a particular audience and a particular purpose. And there is a massive spike, you know, and we've got how many? 500 of these things. Um, and by the following year, they're all gone. So you can big fashion spike and then it's gone. People have, yeah, seen it, done it. And then you get a few desultory examples after that and then they're gone forever. So, um, and then in actualities, again, it's the same thing. They go, they shoot, you know, people moving past the camera and then they begin to go, this is boring, oh, we're going to get some shots in the crowd, we're going to get some overhead shots, we're going to move the camera, pan around a big crowd or whatever. And essentially they have created what will then become a newsreel. Um, so these things you can trace by looking through all of the films, you can trace these movements and fads and fashions for new novelties as we talked about right at the beginning. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's all about, by 1901, with fiction film, putting chunks of films together to make longer films. And they go, oh, well, we don't really need the episodic bit. We'll just do a story. So you can watch it happen. Um, happens quite fast. So with every film that's made, they go, how can we make this a bit better? a bit different. So it's the classic capitalist product differentiation, basically. <laughs> so uh, actually our streaming is over. We went a little bit over, but I think there was a last, last question from Donald, so I would like him to have it quickly. Thank you, I'll be the chaser. So, uh, congratulations to both of you, uh, Tony and Brandy, for uh, sharing your work, but also the, the, the labor and the uh, intellectual commitment that you've made, and we're all very grateful for it. Uh, Brandy, my question is based on something I read in the papers a, a year or two ago, and it was an image that came out of Queen Victoria uh, wearing dark glasses, yeah. and, uh, this was a little bit of a stir because, you know, it was so unexpected, but there was some discussion about why that was, and I wonder if anything, first of all, I wonder if that came out of your program of restoration, and second, are there any explanations for why that was? Yes, there are. It wasn't actually our program of restoration, but it was associated. So, um, as part of the Victorian project to digitize all of our Victorian films, we worked on these large format 68 millimeter biograph films and um, coming out of that because um, a lot of the films are uh, of that format are also held in 
uh, Eye Film Museum. Uh, they did some work on their 68 millimeters, and then MoMA decided that they would do theirs. And the MoMA collection of biograph films is wonderful. They've got some beautiful 68 millimeter films. They're superb, some of them. And they have a, a number of British titles which were shot by Dixon in London and then sent back to the American company. So this is the model that they had. They had sort of companies all around Europe. Um, the big, big one in London, big one in, in New York and they shared material. So stuff would come over from the States, was shown all around Europe, and it went in the other direction. So they had um, this film, which was Queen Victoria on her final visit to Dublin, and she's in an open carriage, and she's wearing what looks like shades. And um, I saw this in at MoMA in New York, and gave out a great big yell. I go, oh my God, it's Queen Victoria. And uh, they went like, what, what? And um, I said, well, you know, it's, it's the only time you can actually see Queen, Queen Victoria, because in all of the other films of her, she is either too far away and too blurry to see, or she's under a parasol, which is relevant, or somebody's just shoved a great big bunch of flowers in front of her face, <laughs> which they do all the time. And... Um, so finally, we get to see Queen Victoria, and the reason she's under the parasol is because she had problems with her, she had light sensitivity, and that's why she's wearing shades. So, these are the weird things that <laughs> become uncovered by looking at these funny little films. Thank you very much, that was lovely. Uh, thank you everybody, and i see you tomorrow. Thank you, Rayoni, thank you, Tony. <laughs>